Hi there and good evening. Thank you all for joining us as we have gathered once more for a very uh, important conversation. And so we appreciate you taking the time. This is the 11th Community Forum on Racial Bridge Building, an effort that has been put together now 11 times, uh, showing you the commitment and dedication to dealing with the whole issue of race and us living together, loving on one another. Uh, as we get ready to start, I wanna first acknowledge those churches, ministries that have partnered and that have come together to make this happen. Mount Moriah Missionary Baptist, Matthews United Methodist, Matthews First Presbyterian, as well as uh, Cross and Lutheran, and uh, Matthews First Baptist, not sure, I wanna make sure I acknowledge everyone. My name is Tanya Rivens. I work in a radio and television and in print here in the city. And it's just an honor to be able to join you and to have this conversation. But with everything, before we move any further, it's always great to set the atmosphere. So I'm going to ask Pastor Chuck to please come forward and lead us in prayer before we get started in this conversation. Thank you, Tanya, and uh, welcome to all of you here in this setting. Honored that you're with us again tonight for our 11th community forum around this. Let's pray together. Eternal God, we give you thanks for the privilege that is ours just to be together. Now, God, engage us this night. Challenge us. Help us to be more than what we ever thought that we could be. Make us better in the midst of these important discussions around matters related to racial justice. Be with us for this we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Chuck. So, you know, we've heard so much and so many conversations now about race and how do we deal with it? And pretty much wherever you turn, a lot of people now are acknowledging and having this conversation. It's a tough conversation and it's uh, a bunch of layers uh, but salute and hats off to the Matthews area churches for bringing this together and holding this conversation. And I would say kind of blazed the trail because they've been doing this, as I mentioned, for 11 years. So it was out front before it really became a thing for people to start discussing. So tonight we've got like a very distinguished guest and there are so many words I can drop on to introduce uh, our guest who's going to present to us. Um, it was shared with me. He has written over 80 books, sold over a million copies and someone who's very well respected in the body of Christ. Um, supposedly retired with all that he's doing. I'm not quite sure what type of retirement this is, but certainly we are grateful and honored to be able to have him as someone to pretty much lead and, and mentor and serve as an example for so many of us that desire to live more Christ-like every day. He is uh, currently a professor at Duke Divinity School, as well as uh, uh, doing quite a, a few things around when it comes to ministry. And I could continue to pull on words as, as far as him being so well respected as well as a highly regarded and certainly a distinguished individual. So without going any further, I'll allow you to hear from our guest speaker, who even earlier today hosted a forum with pastors. And the conversation was about preaching to confront racism. Boy, that's a very heavy topic. And someone that really knows how to navigate that conversation, well, you got to hear from him tonight. So allow me to introduce to you uh, the bishop, Will Willeman, but keep in mind once he completes the conversation, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. I certainly have some questions and you'll have that same opportunity. Uh, the number will be on the screen and you will be asked to text, text those questions and uh, we'll provide some answers for you. So now let me introduce to you our guest speaker, Bishop Willeman. Good afternoon. Good evening to you, sir. Uh, good evening, Tanya. Great to be with you. Glad to have you. So we are all ears and ready to start this forum, sir. Well, uh, let me just say I'm just still sort of boggled by the notion that you you have been at this in Matthews for twenty for eleven years. I think that's just amazing. Uh, nearly every week. And certainly in the last couple of days, I hear from people saying, uh, we're not getting guidance from our churches. We're not getting help 
from our pastor in thinking through uh, the issues that confront us and race. Uh, what can we say that will make our church not so conflict averse and have these conversations? From now on, I'm going to say, well, why don't you go to Matthews? Because they've been talking about this for 11 years at least, uh, these churches coming together. So congratulations. Um, one of the things that we Christians are called to do is to witness and I think one thing we can do in the present moment is witness that Jesus Christ makes it possible for us to have conversations about issues that many Americans find very, very difficult to talk about. So congratulations. Um, Tanya, you had asked me to say a few things about uh, my book, how I got into this. It, is that right? <laughs> The Willie Earl book? Yeah. <laughs> so the topic of the book, which is um, the Willie Earl book, who lynched Willie Earl? And one of the questions that I wanted to hear was how did you even get involved in uh, even writing the book and answering that question? Uh, you know, I think I got involved the way I bet lots of people here tonight got involved in that <clears throat> uh, to be white, uh, I'm from South Carolina. Uh, I'm of a certain age. Actually, I'm 74. But that means that most of us have to come to terms with our history in white and black, our history and race. And for me, it's, it started at Walford College. A professor said to me my sophomore year, Greenville. Oh, you're from Greenville. Yeah, that's where they had that Willie Earl trial. And I said, Willie Earl? He said, the Willie Earl lynching. Biggest thing ever happened in Greenville. Uh, attracted attention from all over the world. The whole world's press came to Greenville, 1947. And I said, I, uh, I didn't, I don't think about that. And he kind of laughed. He said, well, you only lived to, you only lived in Greenville 18 years. I reckon they couldn't have gotten around to everything, could they? Um, well, that sort of began, that professor was probably very wise in kind of teasing me, I dare you, check out this that your town wanted to keep a secret from you. And I started looking into it. And the short of the story is 1947, a young African-American man was arrested. Uh, he was suspected of having... Uh, knife to death, robbed a Greenville taxi cab driver. He was taken to the Pickens County Jail because his mama lived in Pickens. And he spent Valentine's weekend, really this very time we're in now, in 1947, spent it in jail in Pickens. In the middle of the night, a caravan of taxi cab drivers came over from Greenville. They came to the Pickens County Jail without putting up any resistance. The jailer gave the young prisoner over to the taxi cab drivers. The young prisoner, Willie Earl, had not been charged with any crime at this point. Um, they took him out to the border between Pickens County and Greenville County, and they tortured him to death. And they left his body on the side of the road. Uh, the next morning, uh, Greenville woke up to uh, the first lynching in South Carolina in a number of years. And uh, it was condemned by uh, South Carolina's progressive Democratic governor, Strom Thurmond. Uh, and immediately the FBI got involved and they got confessions from 21 of the 23 lynchers, signed confessions. A trial was held in Greenville about a month and a half later, that attracted international attention. Jessica Mitford wrote a famous piece in the New Yorker called Opera in Greenville, which she talked about the trial and all. All of the lynchers were acquitted by an all white jury in Greenville. So the lynching of Willie Earl is really a twofold tragedy of a, a racist 
an act of racial violence followed by an act of judicial uh, violence, uh, the trial. What, what came to interest me, though, is there was a young preacher in Pickens named Holly Lynn. He previously been an associate minister at Myers Park Methodist Church in Charlotte. Hawley had been in Pickens only a few months. He moved there that summer to Grace Methodist Church. The church burned while he his first August there. Then in December, his wife gave birth to their first child in the Greenville Hospital, and his wife died in childbirth. So here's a young Methodist preacher. His church had burned. They were meeting in the local high school agricultural room. Uh, his wife had died in childbirth. Well, Holly work, woke up that morning in Pickens, and as he went downtown, they said, Preacher, you hear about what happened last night? Uh, they took this man out of the Pickens jail, and, and they killed him. And Holly immediately got with some of the other town clergy, and they called a public meeting. And the purpose of the meeting was to draft a resolution condemning the lynching and saying that the citizens of Pickens County were outraged that this man was taken from their jail and that this had happened. Well, the meeting broke up in a uh, pandemonium when a group from a nearby town came in and said they ought to be giving those lynchers uh, a, an award for saving the state a lot of money. and. Uh, he got what he deserved, et cetera. Well, Holy Lynn was told, uh, son, you've done all you can now. Uh, this is an old problem. Nothing can be done about it. And that needs, you, you've done enough. Well, for Holy Lynn, young gospel preacher as he was, he, he went back home, started working on a sermon. And two weeks later, he preached that sermon. And the title of his sermon was, Who Lynched Willie Earl? And he began his sermon by saying, uh, who lynched Willie Earl? Well, we know the answer to that question. Some men from another county. They've signed confessions. We've seen their pictures in the Greenville News. Uh, and then he paused for effect, <laughs> the way we preachers sometimes do. And he said, uh, who lynched Willie Earl? We did. You did. Those racist jokes you told. The politicians you voted for that have kept African-Americans, didn't use the word African-Americans, but Negroes, from voting. Uh, the laws of South Carolina that have disenfranchised people who fought against Hitler in World War II. Remember, this was right after World War II had ended. They come back home and uh, they're not good enough to participate in American democracy, even though some of them died to defend American democracy. Anyway, um, I call it one of the most important sermons ever preached in South Carolina Methodism. And uh, to their credit, about a month later, the sermon was reprinted in South Carolina Methodist Advocate. Uh, but uh, so the lynching of Willie Earl, one, interested me because it was part of my history. This is me. This is my town, my people. Uh, secondly, it interested me because I'm a Methodist preacher, and to me it stood as an amazing example of a preacher that spoke up and spoke out and thereby applied the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, to a pressing national issue. Tonight is Carolina's last lynching, and of course you've spoken about the book but as uh, someone from uh, that area feeling obligated to share this conversation, um, when I had you uh, and done an interview earlier, um, I believe it's a couple of weeks ago, and since we're talking about race and uh, again, more and more people are having the conversation now, there are some uh, 21 day race event that's happening from the United um, Way of Central Carolina's in the city where they're bringing people together every day learning different topics mm. and uh you know which is a creative way to find a different uh i guess the non-traditional way of trying to get people to focus on it but one of the questions that i had for you realizing that we all have implicit biases and realizing that uh, 
by no means is it just white people that are racist, but it does appear to be a little difficult um, at times for white people to discuss race. What are your thoughts around that <laughs> statement? Yeah, that, Tony, that's kind of an understatement, uh, as you know. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's sweet of you to say it's a little bit difficult. Um, well, you, you know, first of all, you brought up bias. Um, bias is unconscious, deep, implicit uh, judgments that we have in our heads about people, other people, uh, other people who are different from us in various ways. And um, as you know, that's kind of universal. We all have biases. We all have those sort of unstated things that cause us to look at the world in certain ways, to see certain things, not see other things, to do certain things, not do other things. Uh, and that's universal. The trouble is if when you take bias, I mean, for instance, uh, you may have a bias, uh, for all I know, against 70-year-old men. Uh, maybe you've had bad experiences with 70-year-old men. Maybe your mama warned you, uh, be careful of 70-year-old men. Um, I think that's unfortunate as a 70-year-old man, a man. However, your bias doesn't really do damage to me unless that bias is wedded with power. And when you have power to hire me or fire me or uh, uh, give me a loan or sell me a house or a car uh, or admit my child to school or expel my child from school, then, then that bias becomes uh, serious in a new way. I define racism, one way to define it is it's, it's bias, racial bias, judging people on the basis of their race, plus power, power to enact laws, power to enforce certain rules, power to control information, uh, gatekeepers. So uh, white racism, I think it's important to say it, it's a white problem. And it's, it's a peculiarly white church problem where we have allowed our ways of organizing ourselves, our ways of being in the world to be influenced by our racial biases to the degree that the way we've set up the tax structure and the government and et cetera, but maybe more troubling the way we've set up our churches. Uh, my son and I, I've gone to a, we were a Carolina Panthers game and we both love the Carolina Panthers. And even though they do play at a time when I have to skip church to get there to the game anyway. Um, and my son, we're sitting in the stadium, everybody's cheering. And he turns to me, he said, you know, uh, this stadium is more racially hospitable more racially inclusive, just judging from looking around the stands, than any church you've ever served. And I said to my son, uh, shut up. I, I don't want to, you know, <laughs> it's true. And uh, the American church has got, a, it's got some explaining to do. Why is it that uh, every restaurant I go to, uh, every sports game I go to, concert I go to, every school I walk into is not racially segregated in the way the church is. Well, there, there are no more laws enforcing racial segregation. When it comes to the church, you don't have to have laws enforcing racial segregation. We already do it. And because sadly in church, the government cannot make us uh, be racially inclusive. In church, we're free to gather with whomever we want to gather with. And isn't it interesting that white Christians like to gather with white Christians? So um, I think it is a deep, pervasive matter. Bias is really hard to overcome. Uh, the main thing I think with bias is, is to do the best we can to acknowledge it and note it. 
Uh, for instance, when I'm at a party and somebody walks up to me, I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying this, and someone walks up to me and I said, oh, well, what do you do for a living? And they say, uh, I'm a dentist. And I say, oh, uh, um, uh, wonderful, wonderful. Well, suddenly tapes start playing in my head from when I was eight years old and my dentist didn't believe in Novocaine and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's bias. And that, that, that's something that ought to be acknowledged and, and dealt with. Uh, racism, though, is, is more pernicious because racism infects all of our mechanisms, our laws, uh, our institutions in such a way that it really damages people. And, and by the way, one of my points is racism doesn't only damage the victims of racism. Yes, it does. But, but it also damages the perpetrator. And Martin Luther King said to African-American churches of his day, uh, maybe God has called you to help white Christians uh, experience have experienced the deeper love of Jesus. Maybe God has called you to help white Christians be unburdened from this burden that they labor under, uh, their own race defense. So, well. So that's a good segue. And for those that are watching again, you're going to have an opportunity to ask questions as well. Um, we're going to get to that, but we have some more uh, uh, questions for you uh, that have kind of been created from conversation. If Pastor Chuck is getting questions in, we'll go ahead and jump in that. But I kind of want to know what did you share today with those pastors uh, when you discuss preaching to confront racism? Can you kind of tell us what what you uh, was telling them or what kind of advice? Um, you know, we had quite an extensive discussion. Uh, I urged them uh, in service to the gospel of Jesus Christ to speak up, speak out. Uh, I said to them that a lot of white Christians, and I bet you a lot of them are here tonight, a lot of white Christians, God has placed on their hearts a real burden in this area. And we preachers you know, comes with the job of preaching is you talk about things people find hard to talk about, like God, <laughs> Jesus Christ. You also talk about things like that people don't want to talk about, like our sin, our infidelities. Uh, I, so I, and I must say that the preachers gathered there uh, were, were those who I think are really wrestling with this because they, they report that many times when I speak out on this subject, I get flack from the congregation. I, there's certain members who don't like it. I urge them, I said, well, I think you got to listen to that. You got to respond to that. But I beg you, think about those members who may not have spoken up, but are literally dying to hear a word from you about this, that, that Maybe, sadly, there are people who've left our churches that have left our churches because they've given up on their pastor talking about anything that is truly challenging and difficult. Uh, so we, we had a great conversation. I, I must say uh, that I don't think the pulpit is the only place to talk about racial issues or maybe even the best place. I think better are other conversation opportunities in the life of the church. Nevertheless, the pulpit is the main place that we say, here's the gospel, here's scripture. Now, let's set it next to our lives, our world, and let's see what happens in that interaction. Well, I know when you uh, mentioned other places, uh, hats <clears throat> off to Matthews United Methodist and Mount Moriah, they have this thing called Peace Mills. I believe I'm explaining that correctly, where they have partnered and uh, they have lunch or dinner together, uh, an African-American and someone from the predominantly white congregations. And they've been doing that for quite some time. 
that something that simple could make all the difference in the world and having these Absolutely. uncomfortable conversations. And I wish more people would you know, look for ways. I know there's been the swapping out of services, but it, it goes beyond that. And especially in a climate like what we're in today. So with me, with a teenager, 17 African-American <laughs> male, I finally found myself like terrorized every time he went outside because the climate we're in, I worry about him. And not because yeah. of uh, what he might say or do, but just because of the color of his skin. And even my mom, who's 85, who has said, you know, I never thought I would see it go back to this, you know, in this situation. So as Christians, you know, Pastor Chuck has on his mask, love one another. We've gotten so far away from that. So many of us and a lot of us as an African-American just can't figure out. I know it's about privilege and power. But why can't we just be seen as just like your brother, your sister, your mom, your dad, just someone that's just as loving and caring and trying to figure out how do we get beyond just what's on the surface, which is skin color. And, you know, uh, this is an imperfect analogy, but in the book, I, ta I compare white racialized thinking um, with addiction. Uh, and if you've ever loved anybody who's addicted to chemical substances, say, you know it is so hard because it's not good enough to say, you need to stop drinking. Uh, you need to let alcohol not control your life. You need to get free of that demon. Um, talking to them can help, but oftentimes it is so deep. It is so ingrained in their souls uh, that it it's only through horrible pain and struggle that you can be free of that. Well, I, I, as I say, this is an analogy, but, but white racism is something like that. And I'm afraid to be black in America means to keep being disappointed, uh, like your grandmother you mentioned, to say, I can't believe we're still talking about this. It, you know, at my age, after all, I thought we had made more progress. To be white in America, I think, means to keep being surprised. I cannot believe that those words came out of my mouth. I cannot believe I have this reaction. And uh, in the book, uh, I what I did was I wrote some of my students former students who are now preachers in South Carolina, the week after the Mother Emanuel yeah. massacre. And I just said to them, what did what you preach on last Sunday? Uh, how about send me a copy of your sermon? And so they did. And one of the preachers was Michael Turner, a student of mine, and, and he's in Simpsonville, South Carolina. And Michael started out his sermon by talking about Dylan Roof. And he said, what kind of person, what kind of human being would walk into a prayer meeting, be invited into the prayer meeting, and then massacre the unarmed people there in the meeting? I, I can't even use the word human being for something like that. What, what kind of family life? What kind of, how was he produced? How, and then Michael uh, switched and said, uh, last week, I took some time off. We, we had a little family vacation, went to Atlanta with the children. And I'm walking down the street coming from a show, and um, my two white, blonde children next to me, and there were three young African men standing on, African American men standing on the street corner. And they were laughing and they were talking. And he said, as we got closer, I just instinctively reached out and drew my children close to me. And I immediately felt anxiety. And I looked in the faces of my children and I had communicated that anxiety to them. They looked anxious. We got closer and closer. And as we got to the group on the corner, one of the men said, hey, y'all having a good time in Atlanta? And I, I said, uh, uh, yes. He said, good, yeah, be careful, be careful. Uh, uh, y'all be careful getting back to your hotel, but y'all have a good time. Uh, and Michael said, we got to the other side of the street and I stood there and I said, I am Dylan Roof. 
the same stuff, it, it's down in me. It's deep. I don't want to be like that. Who will deliver me from this? And then he ended his sermon preaching on the Holy Spirit and just said, I'm sorry, this demon will not be driven out except through prayer. And then Michael said, uh, I think I've tried to do the best I can. I've spoken out on this subject. I've tried to build my church around these concerns. And here we are again with this horror. Uh, he said, I don't know anything to do, but what I do when I'm, I'm faced to brick wall like this, I'm on pray. So Michael comes down out of the pulpit, he says, if any y'all want to pray with me, I'm going to be praying as we have our final hymn. Well, Michael said, he heard all this rumbling behind him <laughs> and he looked up around him. The entire church got up and started running down to the altar oh. and people just threw themselves down on their knees and people were weeping. And he, he said, we had church for about another 45 minutes that day. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm so I, I, my message to my fellow white Christians is, um, uh, Jesus Christ is able to deliver us of this, but it, it's going to take some work and it's going to take some prayer. Well, excuse me. Didn't mean to go to preaching. No. <laughs> well, certainly we didn't get to this point overnight again. This is the 11th forum on racial bridge building. And it's truly an honor to have Bishop Willeman here. And uh, you know, when you say 11th forum, it, it's, it's inspiring that y'all been at this for 11 years and it's kind of depressing that y'all been at this for 11 years. Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the conversation is always good and we see movement, advancement. And uh, I've just been thrilled Thank to you, be Jesus. a part of Amen. So we're going to take some questions, Pastor Chuck, if you're getting some in right now. Again, text your questions. The number is being provided. And I know you want to hear more from the author uh, who lynched Willie Earl and, of course, Carolina's last lynching. So, Pastor Chuck, you got some questions? For sure us? do. All right. So Bishop Tanya, we haven't been at it quite 11 years. We've been doing two forums a year All right. for about the last six years. So uh, we don't live it, it doesn't sound quite as good, but uh, two forums of which we're uh, trying to just keep these topics before people make sure that we wrestle with those things. So uh, just to remind you, text your questions, the numbers there on your screen, we'd love to be able to hear from you. So question number one, Bishop, um, you know that tonight there are going to be people that are going to reject your thinking. They're simply going to reject. You're going to have critics that will argue, well, that's just nothing but, uh, you know, that, that academic critical race theory stuff. Or they're going to say it's too liberal. They're going to say it's just Marxist, communist ideology. They're going to say, you know, it's about, uh, it reduces black people to a state of helplessness and victim mentality. Or, you know, the big one that, that I hear, uh, you know, if you talk about that stuff, you're just abandoning the good news gospel and you're replacing it with problematic calls for social justice. So what do you say to this kind of criticism? <laughs> Well, your first point is, uh, I'm a preacher, and so I'm accustomed to somebody disagreeing with me. I'm accustomed to somebody rejecting what I say. It kind of comes with a job. And um, what do you say when somebody says to you after a sermon, I don't like the way you said that, or I don't, I, I think you're wrong. Most pastors I know say, I'd like to hear more about that. How about coffee, Monday morning? You got time? Uh, or uh, tell me more. Tell me what it was that you didn't like about what I said. Uh, so rejection is okay. Uh, preaching is kind of one person standing up talking to a bunch of other people, and they got to be quiet and let the person finish. So I think people got a perfect right to come back and say, uh, I don't like I don't like that, uh, or you shouldn't talk like that. And, and maybe I've asked my students sometimes, when does a sermon begin? And we kind of said, you know, sometimes a sermon begins at the church door after the service when somebody says, "I never heard anything like that before." 
uh, what, what's going on? And, and so you, you start that dialogue. Um, your other list of responses, I don't want to dismiss people. On the other hand, <laughs> everything you said, Chuck, uh, I've heard before. And I find it, uh, some of the responses I find just to be absurd and laughable. I mean, Marxist, racist, critical theory, come on, I wouldn't know that if it bit me. Um, uh, and uh, to say, uh, for instance, that statement is interesting. You've substituted the good news of the gospel for social justice preaching or something. Uh, I'm going to have to know what Bible you're reading on that and, and how you figure that out. Uh, one, I'm afraid you're just simply repeating stuff that you've heard on talk radio or somewhere. But does everybody understand this is a church? <laughs> We're supposed to be working out of scripture. We're not working out of conservative politics or liberal politics. We're supposed to be answerable to scripture. And, uh, I think it is wonderful good news that you don't have to live the life that you were bred to live. Christ can give you a better life than the one you thought you were fated to live just simply because of where you were born and your race and whatever. So, and I, I'll say this, that white racism is just infinitely resilient and infinitely resourceful. And so it morphs. And one, one last thing is, you know who you're talking to here. I'm, I'm from South Carolina. And ever since I was a child, I'd hear, I'd hear politicians in South Carolina say, it's not about race. Uh -uh, it's not about race. It's about strict constitutional interpretation. It's not about race. It's about states' rights. And uh, the senator from South Carolina, one of them, uh, just recently said uh, uh, race wasn't part of this capital insurrection or riot. Uh, really? Well, being from South Carolina, so I looked at the riot, I saw just a bunch of white people, and a lot of them were carrying Confederate flags. Uh, uh, I bet your race was involved in there. And I, I think if anybody wants to argue race is a non-existent subject that race doesn't explain anything. Ah, uh, wow, you got an uphill battle because I think statistics alone uh, are, are going to be hard for you to explain away, much less my sermon. But <laughs> and that uh, is an important one. Um, and back to the subject of lynching. Uh, it's been said that lynching was one of the scars that was a result of the church's silence or even outright support of these kind of things. Are there, are there other scars, Bishop, that you could name for us tonight? Mm. I, oh, I bet I could yeah, I bet I could come up with quite a list. Uh, I do think the lynching is, uh, I mean, for instance, I looked. I could only find in the entire state of South Carolina and all the white churches, I could only find two sermons that mention the Willie Earl lynching. Uh, that's, that, that's, that's pretty damning judgment. Um, but other scars, I mean, for instance, uh, someone was telling me, uh, a Methodist preacher was telling me last night, uh, reading a book on lynching and capital punishment. And, and these statistics are just amazing. If you take the states, take a state like North Carolina, take a state like South Carolina, and um, Here's the number of lynchings that occurred from about 1870, when lynching really got in full swing, 1880, uh, through the 1920s and all. Uh, it, it's a horrible number. Uh, if you look at those states 
and their uh, execution by capital punishment of people, you got the same trajectory. Uh, the states that do the most executions are the states that have the highest number of lynchings. Is there a connection? I, I bet there is. Is race somehow involved in capital punishment? Look at the numbers. Yeah, uh, it is. And um, so uh, maybe we keep discovering these connections. And it's a great question to ask, what are the uh, injustices? What are the sins against God's will for us that are going on right now that we're not speaking out on? I mean, for instance, one is sexual abuse uh, by clergy, by churches. Uh, we, for too long, uh, have been silent. And now it's coming out uh, and how many Christians will be damaged spiritually forever because of our silence, our complicity in this? Uh, how many people will stop, uh, you know, trusting the church? Uh, I just read a testimonial by someone who said, I'm a fundamentalist Christian. I'm uh, Bible-believing. I'm conservative. I have given my trust to this pastor and this church. And uh, now it, it found out that our pastor uh, supported ungodly, unchristian activities by the President of the United States not only his adultery and his lying, but other things. And he said, uh, I'm no longer a Christian. I, if, if, if my pastor couldn't tell the difference between uh, someone living a pagan lifestyle and a Bible-believing Christian, I'm out. Well, that, that just that breaks your heart. But it's a warning to us preachers to say, what's the price of our not? speaking out as God leads us to speak. Just a reminder, everyone that is out listening and watching tonight, uh, the phone number on your screen, 336-848-5085. We invite you to send in a few of your questions. All right, Bishop, you still ready? You know, one of your, your questions, I was thinking, you know, I'm a preacher and preaching is not about racism. Preaching is not about justice. Preaching is about Jesus Christ. Uh, and I think therefore appropriate, you know, why are you talking about this subject? I think I could demonstrate it. I'm talking about it because Jesus Christ is Lord and we're not. I'm talking about it because Christ came into the world to save sinners. And our sins are manifold and various, but for us, racism is the pervasive intergenerational sin uh, for us uh, white Americans. So um, I, I do, yeah, I, I chafe when people say, oh, is this your latest cause that you've hitched on to? I said, no, it's called the Gospel of Matthew. It's called the 10th chapter. It's called, well, okay. Yeah, let's, let's hear from others. All right, another question. How can church members best support our clergy about this issue? That's Ooh, one part. That. Whoever uh, wrote that, I'd love to have you as a layperson. I know, isn't that great? And then the, <laughs> yes. the, the second part of it, Bishop, is... How can we help people understand white privilege and its effect on non-white people? Well, the first part of the question, I've, I've, I've said to lay people, when lay people complain to me that their preacher's sermons are boring or they're not relevant to anything or they're inconsequential, I say, now, when's the last time you have praised your pastor? 
when your pastor appears to have stepped out and said something that was hard to say or something that could be costly to say. And I've said to lay people, some of y'all get the preaching you deserve. Now, I, I get a lot of pushback from lay people on that statement. But I say to them, you know, you'd be surprised how utterly dependent we are on the lay people feeding back. The lay person who said to me the other day, what can I do to get my preacher to speak up and speak out? I said, talk to your preacher. Tell him. Uh, your preacher may be under the impression that nobody wants him to say anything that would ruffle any feathers let him hear from you and to say, I need you, pastor. Give me some guidance here. Give me some teaching. So um, you can support your pastor. And I, I got to say that I don't think we pastors get too far beyond our congregations. And so you want more courageous, better preaching than be a more courageous listener uh, and responsibly. The other part of your question uh, or the statement was um, what can we do to help people see um, the damage that our biases in action, that our racism does? Uh, I think we can do what at, at your church, uh, uh, partnering with another church, uh, we can listen. We can try to provide safe spaces where people can be honest with one another. We can ask questions. Uh, my daughter was saying the other day that she was talking to a woman uh, who's a mother, a fellow mother with her in their school, and both their boys play basketball together. And uh, she said I was talking to her about our boys loving basketball and this kind of thing. And then the mother, uh, said, uh, maybe you could help me with something. Um, I, I, the coach said something uh, the other day to, to my son, and he came home and he started crying about it. And I tried to, I tried to soothe him, and I tried to say probably the coach didn't mean it the way it sounded. And then he said, well, the other day, coach said this to me and all. And uh, my daughter said, um, I just started weeping and thinking, oh, my Lord, no one has ever said anything like that to my children. I cannot believe you're having to deal with this. Uh, that is awful. And, and, and so anyway, the mother said, uh, really, I'm, I'm seeking your help. Uh, how do you think I can talk about this with my son? Anyway, I'm. I guarantee both of those people walked away from that conversation, different people, changed. And so we can talk. And in fact, I, I talked to the pastors today. I, I said, I, I think I could demonstrate that if you've got a really difficult, painful subject to discuss, if you've got a subject that you're afraid to talk about in public, Save it for the church. Save. Talk about it only in the church. Because in the church, it's amazing. When we start out a conversation and I say, hi, I'm Will. I'm a sinner. I think God is working in me to make me better than I was. But I'm still on the way. I, I still got work to do. Now, uh, and I'm assuming that you're a sinner too. And I'm assuming that a lot of stuff you say is colored by your own biases and the way you were brought up and all. Now, let's have an argument. Let's have a discussion. And after we have that discussion, we're going to go to the Lord's table and have the body and blood of Jesus. What an amazing gift that is God has given us to be able to talk in that setting. Uh, there's no way Congress can talk like that. There's no way you can talk like that at, at the Civic Club downtown. Uh, no you got to be in the church convened by Jesus to talk, to have those conversations. So let's do it. So Bishop, how do you respond to the criticism given to the Black Lives Matter as a social justice movement 
part one. And then if you would respond to attempts to equivocate, I think they're saying the recent violence at the Capitol with violence in the summer protests. How do you respond to the criticism of the Black Lives uh, Matter as a social justice movement? And then second, respond to attempts to equivocate the recent violence. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, the, the two, let me, the second one, there's no way. <laughs> uh, the great theologian Dave Chappelle, uh, I saw on CNN just before I came on tonight, uh, was saying now, uh, all you white people that went berserk when uh, Kaepernick, the pro football player, took a knee during the national anthem and you wanted him fired. Uh, you, the president called him all kind of names. <laughs> and, and yet uh, an all white mob uh, tries to take over our government. Five people are killed. Uh-uh. Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, there was destruction of property. Uh, that was condemned. Uh, there was uh, there was violence. Uh, people got hurt, including law officers and all. But uh, when you consider the thousands of people in the streets, the the uh, it, it was an amazingly nonviolent uh, protest, and it was also yeah, and you know. Uh, well, I'd say, but you know, I, I, I'm, I'm made uncomfortable by a lot. I'm made uncomfortable when people are angry. I'm made uncomfortable when people are cursing and saying uh, negative things. Uh, on the other hand, I think as a Christian, you gotta, you gotta do your best to understand you got to do your best to listen. And by the way, I can name you a bunch of Christians. One of them is like 72 years old. And she was on the streets of Raleigh, North Carolina, the Black Lives Matter. And she said, I'm not proud of it, but I set out the 60s. I didn't march to desegregate the schools. I didn't march uh, for social justice and North Carolina health care. Uh, I just thank God that I didn't die before I got this opportunity to be in the streets with these young people. And uh, that's why I'm here. And so uh, I, I want to say that, you know, there were a lot of grateful white people who were grateful for the Black Lives Matter, giving them an opportunity to speak up and speak out. Uh, so, you know, I, I was not out in the streets because of COVID. I, I told myself maybe it was because I was, uh, but uh, on my street, uh, this mostly a white street, uh, at least half the residents have Black Lives Matter signs out on their lawns. Uh, for them, the Black Lives Matter movement has been a, a gift. So, questions are coming in hard, so that's great. Love that. So, all right, here's, here's one, and I want to share this. Uh, this person writes to me saying, Pastor Chuck, I'm Andrew Manus from Macon, Georgia. At Brian Stevenson's Monument for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama, there's a display of a casket like monuments hanging from the ceiling of a pavilion. Each one commemorates all of the lynching victims from particular counties in the United States. Among them is a casket from Jackson County, Georgia. It has only one victim of lynching listed on it. The victim's name was Jeff Bolden. And the date of the lynching was December the 25th, 1898. This person writes, uh, Andrew writes, I'd like to get Bishop Williman's reaction to that. Um, 
I'm not sure. Reaction to uh, the, the monument or the casket, the name? or Yeah, it must be the, the victim's name, Jeff Bolden. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know whether the, he, he's saying, uh, I, I think it's amazing there's only one. Uh, or uh, I, I'll just say that I urge everybody to try to get to that monument in Montgomery. Uh, I just think you'll be changed. It, it is, and like back to the Black Lives Matter movement, the, the basically, as I experienced it, it's just, it's just getting the names out there. Those are the names. And you look at those names on those slabs, uh, I just, it, it's a powerful experience. And by the way, Willie Earl's name is there and uh, his dates. And uh, yeah, so I, I just, I, I find Brian Stevenson and his work amazing. And also that, that monument, I, I, I just think, and I'm, I am proud that some people in America are willing to face the truth about our past and tell it and experience it. Because I believe Jesus Christ is not only the way and the life, but he's the truth. And telling the truth is a good thing. And in fact, it's, uh, hey, we all know what tomorrow is. It's Ash Wednesday. And um, beginning the Christian season of Lent. And you might think of Lent as the time when the church tells the truth about who killed God's son and the cross and the lynching tree, as James Cone reminded us, or go together. Uh, they, are, they are embarrassingly horribly similar. Uh, well, being a Christian means I am actually, I don't have to put on a mask. I don't have to, uh, I, I, I need to put on a COVID mask, but I mean, I don't have to lie about who I am and where I've come from. I can tell the truth. Jesus Christ enables me to do that. So anyway, I, I find that, that, uh, memorial an amazing place. This question, Bishop, this person writes, I have heard theologians say that white Christian nationalism is the most dangerous thing we are facing and is connected to most social justice issues. What's your thought about that? It's connected to most social justice issues. I wonder what that means. Uh, I, I got to admit, I don't know a whole lot about white Christian nationalism. I'm probably guilty of thinking of that as a kind of fringe thing. There are those who say that what happened in Washington uh, in the insurrection is a, is a new, is, is a look into the future. This is not just a few very deranged people, but it is a huge movement that's frightening. Uh, as Christians, we're always nervous when we or anybody else gives to God glory that should only be given to God. Uh, yeah, but I don't, I don't understand about the connection to social justice issues uh, un unless that movement is consumed with certain issues. Uh, but yeah. I'm, I'm just, probably just don't know enough about it. All right. Thank you. You need, uh, you need to catch your breath for just a moment. We're, we've been peppering you hard. So, uh, no. All right. Here's another one. Thanks for the interaction. Since it's virtually impossible to not see color, how do you answer people who say, I don't see color? Um, you know, <laughs> blindness is not a virtue. Uh, Jesus healed people of blindness uh, frequently. Um, well, I think people of color whom I know say, I don't want you not to see my color. I want you to see it. I want you to 
revel in it. Isn't it amazing that God has created such a diversity of people? I'm proud of my color, uh, an African American might say. Uh, I, 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 you know, and I think um, that's a bold claim to say uh, you don't see color. I know uh, I took a bias test and and there are a bunch of bias tests. They're online if you're interested in all, all kinds of tests. But one thing is you were shown pictures of people and you were asked questions like, which one is a plumber? Which one is a jazz musician? Which person here is a heart surgeon? And um, even trying very hard not to be prejudiced against the way people are dressed and all. I mean, it, <laughs> it's, yeah. Bias was revealed. And um, uh, if, a, if I walk into a bank to borrow $10,000, an, an African-American who has exactly the same educational background as I do, uh, makes as much money as I do, if they go into that bank, studies routinely show, I'm going to get the loan before the African-American will get the loan. Uh, I, do, I just think color is a fact. And, and by the way, skin color uh, is something God created. Uh, God enjoys the diversity of people. What was wrong is for white Christians to buy into the very non-Christian European Enlightenment notion, which came part and parcel with slavery and with colonialism, to buy into the notion that skin color designates human worth in some way, that uh, physical characteristics are revealing of other human attributes. That's racism, and, and, and it's, it's so sad the church bought into that uh, in North America, the, the white church. Just want to remind people that uh, the number there on your screen, 336-848-5085. We still have time for a couple of more questions. All right, Bishop. Um, here's one. During the Great Awakening, religious movement of past centuries, the church came to focus on individual conversion and personal piety as opposed to earthly liberation. How do you see this focus being hmm. lived out today? Um, you, and, and, you know, by the way, there were a number of factors that contributed to that, the kind of personalizing, subjectivizing of, of Christian salvation. Uh, and the Great Awakening was part of that. I, I, I want to hasten to add, though, people like Charles uh, Finney, uh, Theodore Weld, the Grimke sisters from South Carolina, they were part of the Great Awakening, but the Great Awakening also gave birth to the anti-slavery movement in America. Uh, so just as, as we Christians, we, we, we've done both uh, along the way. But I, I do, it, it concerns me that when most people think about the Christian faith, in our culture, they think about something that is personal, my personal salvation. What is Jesus Christ? Well, Jesus Christ is here for me to believe in him. And if I believe in him and all my heart, then I get to go to heaven when I die. There's a lot of stuff left out in that description of Jesus. Uh, I think you'd be on more solid biblical ground to say, uh, Jesus Christ comes to us announcing the advent of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is here. Well, how do we know it's here? Well, the poor have good news preached to them. Uh, the, the hungry are filled with good things. The lame walk, the blind see. Uh, and so therefore, rather than saying uh, Christianity is something subjective that makes me feel better about myself or taking my heart. I think better to say, well, here's the way I put it on Sunday morning. The, the business of Sunday morning is, first of all, who is God? Uh, two, what is God up to? 
in Jesus Christ. Three, how can we hitch on to what God's up to? And so you notice when Jesus came to people in the, all the Gospels, he begins his ministry not by going up to people and saying, hey, I need you to believe in me with all your heart. Uh, no, he says, follow me. Of course, you expect me to say, well, who are you and where are you going? Because it's just first the gospel. You haven't even done any preaching yet. But uh, Christianity is an attempt to walk behind Jesus. It's, it's an attempt to obey Jesus. And um, that's what's missing in a lot of presentations of American Christianity. Uh, and the Wesleyan in me, I don't want to upset you Lutherans and Presbyterians and all, but the Wesleyan in me would say, it, it, it's also not only what Jesus has done for me, uh, but what Jesus is currently doing in me. We call it sanctification. And Wesleyans used to be big on, and, and that is that, that, that uh, salvation names the work of God in my life so that I can hitch on to what God is doing in the world. And uh, I think in regard to race, I, I just wonder if Jesus is saying to us, look, um, I'm going to get my way with the world one way or another, and I'd like you to be part of it. Uh, why wait to some future date to get on board? Start loving your neighbor now. Uh, start treating everybody as my cherished, valued children. Now, uh, start living into my kingdom now. And if somebody wants to dismiss that as social justice gibberish, uh, fine. But I think you're going to have to answer to the Gospels. You're going to have to answer to Paul when Paul said, uh, you know, God has shown mercy on all that all sinners though they be may be swept up into his salvation. Well, okay, here, go on preaching again. All right. So Bishop, I have a question and this is around a lot of conversation and the climate that we've come out of right now. I constantly see on social media, um, pastors, leaders in the faith community kind of going back and forth about what really uh, should be taught. And a lot of times it's uh, about evangelicals and their message uh, versus what some others are saying, especially uh, where they're just calling one another out. And I think, frankly, it's quite confusing to believers. <laughs> um, you know, who are we supposed to allow to teach us if they can't get it right? <laughs> you know, uh, that's that's a beautiful plea from a layperson. Uh, I, I do think it's the nature of the Christian faith that from the beginning, from the first time we laid our eyes on Jesus, the, the argument started. And even among his own disciples in the Gospels, they say, we never saw anything like this. That's not the Messiah, is it? Uh, uh, are you the Messiah? Or, or are we supposed to look for somebody else? John the Baptist's disciples asked Jesus that. And um, so I think there's a lot of debate. I've had Muslim students, for instance, uh, say to me, uh, you know, in Islam, it, it's pretty clear what Islam teaches and it's direct. Of course, I'm thinking, wait a minute, there's a bunch of different parties in Islam, but, uh, but say you Christians are just a mess. And, uh, but I think almost Jesus by his nature for instance, I got to talk to a group about Jesus. Uh, they come to Jesus and say, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Straightforward question. Yes or no, Jesus. Come on. Yes or no. Direct. Jesus says, who's got a quarter? Uh, Jesus' pockets are empty. We produce a quarter and Jesus says, well, well whose picture is on it? And they say, uh, George Washington. We'll give it back to him if he needs to have his picture on a piece of metal to feel good about it. But uh, you be real careful. Don't you dare give to Caesar what belongs to God. Next question. <laughs> hey, Jesus, you didn't answer the question. 
what belongs to God? Well, one of the Psalms says the earth and everything in it is the Lord's, which is not much left over to give to Caesar. Uh, anyway, just a little vignette there to say that uh, I think debate, controversy comes with the territory. However, uh, at the end of the day, I think all of us preachers, we got to answer to scripture. And so if somebody says to me, this is Christian, and we got to answer to Jesus. And uh, there are a lot of things being said. I, I just think, I, I just, it's hard to imagine our Lord, those words ever coming out of his mouth. Uh, Show me an instance where our Lord ever said, demeaned somebody with a racial slur. Uh, come on. Um, so at the end of the day, we've, we've all got to answer to Scripture and to Christ. I'm not saying that settles the argument, but at least places uh, what we're arguing in. And so the person who comes out and says, your sermon was un-American. And I said, what? My sermon today was un-American? Yes, I, it just, it was unpatriotic. And I said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, this is the church. Uh, I wasn't trying to be patriotic. I wasn't trying to be not patriotic. I was trying to be biblical, believe it or not. Now, what in my sermon did I do to violate the biblical witness? Talk to me about that. This stuff about patriotic, unpatriotic, that's, th this is the church. That's not our task. Uh, so anyway. Well, along the lines of lynching, I want to go back to your book, Who Lynched Willie Earl? And uh, apparently, you. obviously, lynching was an acceptable form of punishment during that time. But to be able to treat another human being in that manner. And I guess it kind of really alludes to the whole Dylan Roof. What type of mindset or what kind of conversation did you get from people when you were researching this book, just to be able to treat another individual like that? Uh, it is horrible. And I think uh, when I went to the Greenville Public Library, when I was a pastor in Greenville, and I said, went to the public library and I said, uh, I'd like to see your files on the Willie Earl lynching and trial. And I, I said, I assume you've got files on that. And the librarian said, uh, uh, yes, just a moment. So another librarian comes back to me and said, why would you like to see these files? <laughs> and I said, I'm interested. I need a reason. I, I'm interested. I'm curious. And um, I said, I'm a Methodist minister here in town. I'd, I'd just like to see what you got on it. I uh, said, oh, well, all right. So it comes back with the trial. They also showed me the microfilm from the Greenville News. And uh, it's got every issue of the Greenville News, except it's missing that day after the lynching. It's disappeared from the library. Well, you gotta, I just think, one, it's just hard to admit the depth of our inhumanity. Uh, it's hard to admit that our forebears committed acts like this. Uh, and you know this probably from the book, but the story I got in Greenville was uh, well, that really wasn't Greenville. That happened over in Pickens. And I said, no, all, all the lynchers came from Greenville. Yeah, well, they were mill, they were rednecks. Uh, they were mill hands. They were lint hands. Uh, those were those ignorant people who live over in the mill village. Well, my friend Will Gravely has gone down to there and found out where all these men lived. Some of them were from the mill village, but half of them weren't. And then on top of that, when the trial came, it was Greenville's most distinguished white attorneys led the defense. And so I'm sorry, <laughs> you can't blame this on poor ignorant whites. Th this was across the board on everybody. So 
I think it's hard to talk about. It's, it's hard to admit. Again, I like to think the Christian faith gives us the means to tell the truth, to not deceive ourselves or lie about it. But, uh, and I think lynching, uh, lynching is really a, a huge wound on the American psyche that really has to be exposed and looked at. And by the way, as you know, the nature of lynching was it was public theater. The, it, they did postcards uh, as souvenirs. Uh, people posed with their children next to the body of the lynched person. Um, it's, uh, and, and you're also, Justified, I think, in lynching, in, in linking lynching with, with crucifixion. Uh, Jesus that was made a public spectacle. And the purpose of lynching, it was an exclusively Roman punishment used mostly for Jews, mostly for Jewish insurrectionists. And um, the purpose was to say, hey, Jew, you better watch. If you get out of line and mess with the Romans, it's going to happen to you. So, Bishop Willeman, thank you. Uh, this has been an incredible forum. Again, racial bridge building. Uh, we're going to start to wrap things up. I would like for you, if you have some closing remarks or comments, to go ahead and <laughs> share those right now. I know you've done a lot of talking, but boy, what some powerful you know what I, information. Yeah, I, I laugh because you probably found it hard for me to be concise. Yeah, I'm a preacher, you know, yeah. and um, <laughs> I'm thinking about how many of my congregations would love to have you in there and say, all right, preacher, we, we just got to, could you start wrapping it up? Come on, wind it down. <laughs> um, but um, I just want to, I want to applaud you, uh, all of you here tonight. Uh, these are tough matters for white people to talk about. Uh, and uh, but yet you are, mm -hmm. and uh, as Christians, and I think you are doing that, uh, a witness to the world that Christ gives us, even in our weaknesses and frailty, an ability to do things that the world finds difficult to do. And uh, not to pick on him, but when our former president bragged that he would never apologize for anything, that he would never say, I'm sorry about anything. I'm thinking, well, he ain't a Methodist because Methodists love to get together on Sunday morning. And what's the first thing Chuck does to them? He says, okay, good morning. Glad to have you. Let's all sit down after the first hymn. Now repeat after me. I have done bad. I have not lived up to my best nature. I am sinful. I need saving. I need a God who forgives. Um, well, I'm, so I want to just thank you. And uh, let's all work together that, that Jesus Christ saves sinners. And some of us need saving from our sins of materialism and greed. And others of us need saving from our racist sins. And Jesus puts us where we can do that in the church. And, and what a gift. Uh, also to say that I think uh, there are a bunch of white Christians out there, as I said, that I think God has placed this burden on, on, on their hearts. And, and they really want to give a better witness. They really want to know what can I, little person that I am, uh, do differently. And... Um, uh, so I, I think uh, I just want to I want to praise you. Uh, well, thank you, and we so, want to say thank you so much, Bishop. Uh, distinguished. And, well, and by the way, thank you too. Oh, absolutely. Uh, because uh, I got a lot of African American friends who are just worn out talking to white people about this, <laughs> and I got a friend who's a great African American scholar. And I asked him about coming uh, to a church I was serving uh, to talk to a meal and listen. He said, I am so tired of going to white churches and having a meal and then sitting around talking about this. I'm tired of talking. I won't do something. 
And I said, well, we're going to do something. Uh, but anyway, thank you. I don't know how I could be where I think I am today on this issue without the loving intervention and witness of African-American friends who found a way to get through to me, found a way to talk to me, found a way to say, um, could you just, here's how that sounded to me. Yeah. Just let, yeah. So thank you. Thank all of you. And we can't thank you enough, Bishop. Thank you so much, Bishop Willeman, a retired professor. I mean, re retired minister, but still very busy and a professor at Duke Divinity. We are so grateful. And again, the book, Who Lynched Willie Earl, is still available. And uh, you can see great conversation, uh, incredible information. This forum presented again by uh, five area churches here in Matthews, Mount Moriah, Missionary, Matthews Presbyterian, Matthews First Baptist, along with a Cross and Crown a Lutheran, and of course, Matthews United Methodist. We're going to wrap things up here, and uh, Pastor Chuck is going to come back and do close in prayer. While he's coming forward, the next forum, which is happening on August 17th at 7 p.m., it's at Mount Moriah Missionary Baptist, and make sure you write it down. It will be forum number 12, not the 12th year but for number 12. And these guys, I see no signs of them light, lightening up or holding back. This conversation will continue. And again, it starts with a conversation and recognizing that there is an, an issue here. So Pastor Chuck. Tanya, thank you. And Bishop, thank you so much. You would not believe how people are blowing up my phone. Okay, we didn't get to nearly all of the questions, but I wanna say thank you to folks that have from all over the place that have been asking questions tonight, poignant questions, good questions, stretching kinds of questions. So thank you, thank you, Bishop. Uh, Will at duke.edu, glad to continue the conversation and uh, with blessings. Let's pray together, everyone. Wow, oh Lord, what an evening. To, um, to be with Bishop Williman, to listen to his wisdom, to his humility, to his open heart, to share important words for us. And we pray, oh God, that has been so engaging to each of us to think about these matters, maybe in ways that we've never considered, and to think about the church and what the church can be doing to impact this world. We give you thanks, oh God. We celebrate this night and the fact that the church, this church, the churches of our community can talk about these matters and then act upon them. For this, we give you thanks through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. And go Amen. in peace, everyone. May the God of peace, peace go with you and abide. Amen. Amen.